What's happening, Polite Society? I hope you had a good week. Well, Rachel Held Evans was a popular columnist, blogger, and New York Times best-selling author. Over the course of her career, Mrs. Evans promoted many heretical teachings. Rachel was a member of the progressive movement within the church. One of these days, I'll have to do an entire video on progressivism in Christendom. But for now, I'll just be providing responses to a short video clip that Rachel did in relation to her bestseller, A Year of Biblical Womanhood. This is going to be a two-part response, so I'll be uploading the second half tomorrow. All right, let's delve in. Growing up in the church, I always heard a lot from pastors and Sunday school teachers about the importance of pursuing biblical womanhood. And the emphasis was always on keeping the home, becoming a mother, nurturing that gentle and quiet spirit, and stepping aside so that men could lead. So let me just jump in here and point out that this is of course a caricature. What you often find in progressive literature and content like Rachel's is the hero's journey motif. I grew up in the conservative evangelical church. I was taught this. At some point I began to have doubts, and I ended up becoming this enlightened individual who outgrew the oppressive thinking I grew up with. The problem is, is that there is rarely ever an accurate representation of conservative Christian theology in most progressive material. Yes, it is a blessed thing and a wonderful thing for women to be nurturing homemakers and mothers who have a gentle and quiet spirit. But that is not all that we teach about biblical womanhood. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus to learn. Paul says, let the women learn. Women are to learn theology and come alongside their husbands and teach that same theology to their children. They are to share the gospel with unbelievers if the opportunity presents itself in an evangelical context. In his book, An Analysis of More Than 100 Disputed Questions, Dr. Wayne Grudem has an entire section that outlines the many different ministry roles that are available to women in the church. But like most egalitarians, for Rachel, it was not about equality. It was about power. I'm not sure if she's talking about leadership here in the context of the church or the family. My guess is it's the former. I'm not a pastor or an elder at my church. Like the women at my church, I also submit to our qualified leaders. And yes, they are all men because they are who the Bible restricts the office of pastor or elder to. And I began to wonder, did biblical womanhood require that I change my personality? my gifts, my relationships, even my calling. If by her calling here, she means her calling as a writer, blogger, and columnist, then that calling was definitely not from God. God would not call anyone to promote teaching that directly contradicts his sacred word, which is exactly what Rachel did in her writings. And what about those parts of biblical womanhood that we don't like to talk about in Sunday school? Technically speaking, it's biblical for a woman to be forced to marry her rapist. This is a common argument that you'll see atheists, agnostics, Muslims, other unbelievers, and sadly, even people within the church like Rachel, who claim to be Christians, very often utilize in an attempt to throw the Bible into disrepute. This is an objection that all of us need to be able to respond to at the snap of our fingers. Rarely will anyone who ever attempts this argument mention the three verses which immediately precede this text. But if in the field the man finds the girl who is engaged, and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lies with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the girl. There is no sin in the girl worthy of death. For just as a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this case. When he found her in the field, the engaged girl cried out, but there was no one to save her. This is one of my least favorite subjects in the world. It's top among the many reasons why I don't watch movies and television anymore. Sexual assault, even if it's just on screen, actually makes me physically ill. But as a Christian, I need to be able to give a defense for the hope that is within me, even if it's a difficult and unpleasant subject like this one. I find Rachel to be quite disingenuous here. Being that she was a progressive, I find it highly unlikely that she would have been an advocate for the death penalty. But notice the honor given by God here to the female victim of this crime. In God's eyes, if you sexually assault a woman, it is the same as murdering your neighbor. And the penalty? is death. And I agree with Moses. Rapists should be executed, but that's a different topic for a different day. Here's one of the problems when defending this text. It takes someone like Rachel two seconds to blurt out this argument, but it will take us several minutes to provide a full response. Some people would respond by saying, well, that's just the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament age, so we don't have to worry about Deuteronomy 22. And I think, how can you say that? How can you throw Moses under the bus like that? Is that how Jesus viewed Deuteronomy? You do realize that this is the very same book in the Bible that contains the greatest commandment, right? You do realize that when our Lord was tempted by the devil, his three responses were all from the book of Deuteronomy. 
right? All scripture is theonistos. When Balaam's donkey speaks, that is just as much the word of God as John 3.16. Now, I'm not saying that every single text is equally important, but what I am saying is that the Holy Spirit inspired every single word. So let's respond. In Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29, Moses wrote, If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, who is not engaged, and seizes her, and lies with her, and they are discovered, then the man who lay with her shall give to the girl's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall become his wife, because he has violated her. He cannot divorce her all his days. One of the reasons critics often try to use this passage as an argument in their favor is because many English translations of these verses do not accurately render the original intent of the actual Hebrew. Of course, this text is even a challenge for some believers, too, because when most people hear a person has quote-unquote seized another person, they jump to the conclusion that it automatically means a violent action has taken place. It also doesn't help that dynamic translations like the New International Version erroneously use the R word here. However, formal equivalencies like the King James, the New American Standard, and the English Standard Version do not make that mistake. The truth is that the Hebrew word in this case translated as seizes can actually mean many different things. If we look at other texts in which this word is used, we can see that it often has nothing to do with force, and therefore nothing to do with sexual assault. As the great Dr. Greg Bonson wrote in relation to this word, the Hebrew word tafaz simply means to take hold of something, grasp it in hand. It is the verb used for handling the harp and the flute in Genesis 4.21 and other verses. It is likewise used for taking God's name in Proverbs 39, or dealing with the law of God in Jeremiah 2.8. In Genesis 39.12, Joseph's garment was grasped. And in Deuteronomy 9, 17, Moses took the two tables of the law. We use similar phrases for took in English in the same way. A man can take a bride to be his lawfully wedded wife. The same holds true for hold. We often say that a bride takes a bridegroom to have and to hold. In none of these situations is the idea of force involved. But an even more powerful argument in favor of the interpretation that Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29 has nothing to do with assault is the text's own immediate context. As I mentioned earlier, verses 25 to 27 in the same chapter give a clear case in which sexual assault is definitely being spoken of. In that earlier text, the death penalty was clearly the punishment for the violation. What is most striking when comparing the two cases is that in verse 25, when sexual assault is clearly in mind, Moses uses an entirely different Hebrew word from verse 28. The KJV captures this difference nicely. An even more compelling reason to believe that verses 28 and 29 do not involve a coercive act is the fact that the natural reading of this latter set of verses indicates that both parties are guilty of at least some of the blame. Notice that in verse 28, Moses states, and they, both of them, are found out. Whereas in verses 25 and 26 of the same chapter, he says that only the man shall die and there is no sin found in the maiden worthy of death. Clearly, Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29 is discussing a case of fornication, not assault. I would strongly agree with Dr. Greg Bonson, who argues that the parallel text to this passage is Exodus 22:16, which reads, If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. Notice that in this verse there is no force involved at all, and both parties bear some of the guilt. In our modern society in which we have such a loose view of human sexuality, the idea that God takes the sin of fornication quite seriously is difficult to fathom for many people. But in ancient Israel, if a man seduced a young lady and was able to convince her to sleep with him, the young girl would be in a very difficult situation indeed. She would have had a very hard time finding male suitors. This text is actually a demonstration of God's love and compassion. He holds both parties responsible. The guy can't simply walk away and leave the young lady since women in ancient Israel would have had a very hard time without the financial support of a husband. Therefore, the Lord orders them to get married, stay married, and work through the difficulties of life together. Rachel's accusation that this text teaches that a sexual predator gets to have his victim as a wife as a reward is without merit. As always, the attack against sacred scripture is without any firm grounding. I will complete my responses to the rest of Rachel's video tomorrow, but in the meantime, ladies and gents, if you have your own thoughts, be sure to leave them in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, guys. If you liked that video, please give it a thumbs up. 
If you like the content on this channel, you can subscribe by clicking on the icon on the bottom right. And then you can hit the bell for notifications. I upload a new video every Wednesday and every Saturday. Have an awesome Lord's Day. And for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. I will see you all in tomorrow's video. God's blessings on your week.